and Pastor Kenneth Smith, Buckshot. You know Kenneth in Louisiana. Kenneth has a five-year-old grandson. His name is Jacob. And Jacob has an inoperable uh, brain tumor that is uh, causing him to uh, be sick. Uh, he's throwing up, can't see. And they have left. They in Missouri. They went to St. Louis. And um, so a couple weeks ago, he called me. He said, Pastor, I need you to pray about my little grandson. He's not doing well. And then we got the phone call that he's got cancer, or a tumor that uh, they're going to bombard it with chemo and radiation. And then if he, there's just a slim chance it's going to work. Five years old. Perspective's a powerful thing, isn't it? When you think you've got it bad and you're hurt and something like that, and then you see a five-year-old, it changes everything. So Pastor Kenneth told me, he said, I'm going to stay home, and uh, Sandy, the grandmother's gone up there to be with the family, and so she's going to be up there uh, be with, the, with her grandson. But uh, Kenneth said, I, I can't help them being up there. I can stay here and make money. He works at a plant and pastor. So he already sent me a message. He doesn't know I'm doing this. He has no idea about this. But what I'd like for you to do is when you give today, understand you're, we're going to send this money to this family. And uh, we're going to try to do what we can to help them out. And so it's just one shot at uh, being a blessing to this young man. Amen. So you've blessed me. You've always blessed me. You've always, uh, even through the, the weeks and months, you do things for me. And I, I want to thank you. So today I want to give me a second here. So today I want to preach a message called, I Appreciate You. I appreciate you. And it ain't about me. It's about you. A new preacher moves his things into his new office. In his desk, he finds a letter from the former pastor. The letter says that there are three sealed envelopes in the file cabinet. If you run into any trouble while pastoring this church, open them. Well, of course, the new preacher thinks he will never have to use them. But in his youthful enthusiasm, he tries to change the pews to chairs. Well, this makes the people absolutely furious, and there's a lot of ugly talk about the new pastor. He remembers the envelopes, and he opens the first one, and it says, You haven't been here long, but you've decided to change the pews to chairs. Now everyone is mad. Tell everyone that you decided the pews were fine. So the young preacher did that. And it worked well. He had been there for about a year and a half now when he forgot to mow the grass out in front of the church for Sunday service. Well, this made servant leaders really mad, for they were the ones that set his salary. So now he's in trouble, and he goes to the drawer, and he opens up the second envelope. And it said, you did something to make one of the servant leaders mad, and there's talk of replacing you. Tell them that the lawnmower was broke. He tried this, and again, it worked. Then after three years, he told the women's ministry lady that they were going to have to open the kitchen so that it could be used without any representation from the ladies' ministries. This put the women's ministry into a revolt. So he went back to that third and final envelope, and it said, you've been here about three years now, and you finally got the women mad. My suggestion for you is to prepare three envelopes and place them in the drawer for your replacement. <laughs> I thought hard about that, and I pray to God I never have to write three envelopes. Can I get an amen? But there's not a whole lot of things to get upset about in this church. I mean, I had to look so far, long and hard to find anything that really bothered anyone. The Bible teaches us in the book of Psalms 133 that the function of a good group of people is harmony. And I believe the little country church functions in that. Behold good and how pleasant it is, brothers, to dwell together in unity. It's like the precious oil from the head running down on the beard. The beard of Aaron running down on the edge of his garments. It is like the dew of Hermon descending upon the mountain. Zion. And I know this is kind of wordy, but it, but it literally says that when people come together and, and they are blessed and they have unity, they have fruitfulness and they have fragrance. It's something uh, wonderful. But 19 years of pastoring, we've never had a church split. We've never had a, a major revolt. Amen. People have seemed to have gotten along. I know there have been a few family issues, but that's been the blessing of having two churches. 
Amen. I always tell them, if you're mad at one another, go to the other church. Hallelujah. And it just seems to work out a whole lot better. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 3 tells us, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There's one body. There's one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all. So there's only one body of Christ, amen, and we're just a part of that. And each year here in October, you're so kind to show your appreciation, amen. They even call it Pastor Appreciation Month, and it it, it probably would almost feel like a slam if you were a, a you never got a police officer appreciation month or a, a veterinarian appreciation month or, 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 you know, or a bullfighter appreciation month. But all of a sudden, you're, you're going to do it for the pastor. And, and again, I tell you, for 12 months, I have felt blessed. And, you know, 19 years ago, um, I don't know if you asked me to be your pastor or if, or if I said, okay, I'll stay and we'll do it again. But it happened. And that time, I didn't want a pastor. I didn't want to do this thing again. And I didn't, don't, don't want you to take offense at that. I just what, didn't feel like I was in a place to do it. And yet, God allowed it to happen. The Apostle Paul traveled and he ministered to many different groups of people. He was instrumental in establishing many churches. One church was at Philippi. And when we use the word, the, the, the church, the, the Philippian church, it doesn't mean that they were Filipinos. The Philippian church was an area called Philippi. And that's what they were known as. In Acts chapter 16, verse 9, we read that Paul was, he received, seed but call. Now, I, I can't always tell you what a call is. Sometimes you're sleeping and you, you get a vision. You get an idea. You feel like God just told you something. I'll hear ministers say, or, or people say, well, God called me into the ministry. And, and oftentimes it wasn't God, it was mama. Amen. So, I mean, it does happen, and sometimes it still works out, but I knew it by the age of 19 that I was going to be a preacher. It was, it was the only thing I really enjoyed doing, and I, I, I worked jobs to get to do with the blessing that I got to do, and I would work multiple jobs, whatever, I, whatever it took to keep being able to preach. That's what I did. And Paul had the call, and the Scripture says, in a vision, it appeared to Paul in the night, there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him saying, come over into Macedonia and help us. Now, Macedonia, of course, is where Philippi is. So Paul answered that call, and he went over there. Several things happened. A seller of purple named Lydia was converted. She was actually raised from the dead. She had died, and, and they raised her up. Uh, then second, Paul cast a demon out of a woman. And he and Silas were persecuted as a result. Some of you remember this. I've preached a lot of messages out of this. They were, then they were, they were cast into a, a prison, and there inside the fit prison, their feet were fastened in stocks. He was with a guy named Silas. Remember Paul and Silas in jail? There inside the prison at midnight, the Bible says Paul and Silas began to pray and sing praises. And as they sang praises, something happened in the heavens. I can hear them singing, Hosanna. Blessed be the rock. And old Silas went, woo, amen. And there was excitement hit that place. And when it did, the prison broke open. Now, I've often said that God reached down to kiss them, and the jail got caught in a smack. And when it did, the prison doors flew open, and, and the bars popped off, or the, the, the fetters popped off their feet, and they were free. And looking in through the night, a man pulled out a sword and was going to kill himself. He was the leader of the prison. Had anyone escaped, he'd have paid with his life. He knew it, so suicide was an easier way out for him. Paul yelled at him and said, Sir, do yourself no harm. We're all still here. Then he quoted that famous scripture out of Acts 16, 31, when he said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you and your household will be saved. I grabbed hold of that scripture many years ago, and I said, God, if it was good for him, it's good for me. I'm going to believe in you, and I'm going to believe you're going to save Jimmy and Sandy and Mama and Daddy. Amen. You're going to touch my family. I got a message this week from my sister-in-law that said, I love your preaching, brother-in-law. Man, when you make your sister-in-law blessed, you're good. Hallelujah. Amen. I believe in that scripture, so I held hold of it. This started a sweetheart moment in the life of Paul. And as a result, the jailer got saved, his family got saved, and the Philippian believers loved the apostle Paul. They, there was something about that moment that started revival in the area. They cared for him, not in word only, but also in deed. One time Paul was away, and he wrote in the book of Philippians 4.15, Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again unto my necessity. What he's saying to them is, is I, I've done a lot for a lot of people, and some never reciprocated it, but you never forgot me. You've always looked after me. And when I needed finances, when I needed help, you sent it. And I want to thank you, church, for doing that. So here in the beginning of this epistle, Paul speaks of his love, 
His appreciation for the church at Philippi, he also reveals his desire to visit the church and to be with them. Are you comfortable? Philippians chapter 1, verse 1. I'm going to read you just a couple of scriptures, and I'm going to preach fast. I ain't even started fast yet. Paul said, let me tell you guys something. If I could write a letter to you, little country church, I'd have to quote from the Apostle Paul. Because after being beaten and put in prison and all the things he went through, he said, I know a group of people that have looked after me and loved me through it all. And you have done that for me. When others would have turned away, you became my friends and my family and my brothers and my sisters. I appreciate you. He said, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and the deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus, thanksgiving and prayer. I thank my God every time I remember you. Have you ever remembered somebody and start smiling? And just some, some I start laughing. I have a, a friend that's watching me right now. You know him. He's the old guitar player over here. I talk about Richard quite often. But every time I see a pepper shaker, we were together, Joseph and I, down in, in uh, hunting, and uh, we had some really good food laid out in front of us, a friend made. And uh, Richard grabbed hold of the pepper shaker, and he turned it upside down, and he shook, 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 and nothing happened. And so he set it on the table, and I observed him. And I thought, bless his redneck heart. And I reached, and I grabbed the pepper shaker, and I turned it upside down. And I went, whoa, 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 whoa. and it dumped pepper. And he looked at me, and he said a bad word. <laughs> now, don't I do it? Every time I see a pepper shaker that goes, whoa, 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 I take a picture of it, and I send it to him and say, thinking of you. It's amazing how that stuff works, isn't it? You have friends like that, too. You think like that, too. Thank my, he said, I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you, what a word here, he that began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you, amen, all of you, since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. In other words, what I do, you get credit for. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Father, I thank you for your word. Let my lips share it with season with grace and pepper. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. you may be seated. So, so, so there's three things here Paul mentions. First, he'd like to share his gratitude. And I'd like to share my gratitude with you. Second, he said, I'd like to share my love, and I'd like to share my love for you. I'd like to also share my prayer for you. And so Paul begins to pray. So, but first he said, I'd like to share my gratitude. The Little Country Church to me is an amazing church, and God has done and is doing and will continue to do some great things in this house. I'm so thankful to be a part of this house, and there are many, many reasons that I'm grateful. Paul said here, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and the deacons. Now, I know that the little country church ain't got bishops and deacons. Matter of fact, some of y'all came out of churches with deacons, and you've always been wondering where the deacons at. Amen. Some of you know, you've been in churches, you heard the word bishop. Amen. It's an overseer of churches. Amen. But we don't really have that here. We have some men come in that are overseers of churches. Matter of fact, I'm actually an overseer of churches, but I refuse to be called bishop. I just, it's a little bit of a heavy title. As a matter of fact, I tell you this, that the deacons in this house are servant leaders. They're not only deacons, but they're deaconesses. Amen. There are many women who have chosen to serve in this house without getting a title. Because it's not about a title. It's about a towel. So we don't have meetings to bring people. We say, if you want to serve, you serve. You want to step up, you step up. Amen. So that, that's been this house. And I want to thank God for those who have stepped up. We have some amazing leaders here. Amen. God seeking people who are in leadership roles and do so many things. And, and so that's why I've always referred to you as servant leaders. You lead through serving. I've never had anything but support from each of you. And there has never been an issue that I remember that didn't need, if it needed attention, somebody took care of it. And like Paul, I thank God for the members of this house. Amen. To all the saints, he said, in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi. Each member adds something to this house. In turn, when you are not here, 
Your absence is very apparent. And I'm thankful for each member who walks through those doors each week and faithful in their attendance. That matters. And to those that even watch online that can't come here, I understand that also. I'm thankful for those who clean, take care of the building, who work on the grounds, the OCDs, the old cantankers and dangerous folk we got in this church. Amen. Those who teach, those who lead worship, sing, play the instruments, those who lead two or more prayer nights here, those who serve in the pit crew, park the cars, greet the guests, open the building, serve with joy in the kitchen, the cafeteria. They ain't nothing like getting a meal in the cafeteria or the kitchen from somebody who's smiling. Amen. Ain't mad at you. I appreciate those who work with me in the office and those in the clothing ministries and food pantry, those who run the sound, the overhead, the live stream, those that are in the background that you don't always see that make me look good all the time. And whatever you do, and I know there'll be those that I failed to mention, but whatever you do, it does not go unnoticed. And even though you may not get much recognition, God sees everything. And you've heard me say it before, what we do here? Amen. It's going to keep mattering. Like Paul, I'm thankful for the labor of the little country church. He said, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul says that they had been his partners in spreading the gospel. We couldn't reach people in the kingdom without you. Amen. Some people always act like it's got to be the preacher. That's not so. We all spread the word. Can I get an amen? And used from the time of their conversion until his present time, the people of Philippi were actively involved in Paul's ministry. They were fellow laborers. They worked with him, and they supported him financially. It, the miracles they saw in Paul's life, the, the fact that he kept getting back up even when he was beat down, it did something for them. And, I, and I'm far from a woodman show, and I'm uh, partners together with you at the little country church, and you've always supported me very well financially you've taken care of me but we are also linked up shoulder to shoulder in the kingdom of god amen we got a lot of work to do before it's over the culture is shifting and changing and we got to maintain this book can i get an amen amen we got to maintain i tell pastor Mike, i'm just going to i'm just a conservative it's just who I am. I, my heart is, is for the book. I'm very pro-life. Amen. I'm pro-people. I'm, I'm, I'm for people doing the right thing. So it, it matters to me. Earlier, I mentioned the hard jobs. But what about the spiritual jobs? Many of you, my friend, you visit, you make calls, you text, you write letters, you invite others, you pray for others, you promote the little country church and the kingdom of God on your social media post. I notice it. I notice when you promote the kingdom. I notice when you write something good about somebody. It's a powerful thing. You pray for others, and many of you take the opportunity to witness and to share. And even if you're just a tad offensive in your witness, I thank God for you. Amen. We are to be light and salt. Can I get an amen? And salt irritates at times, and there are times you just got to be here to bother people. If it's going to get them to heaven, bother them. Pester them. Amen. I got pestered into getting saved. I had guys that wouldn't leave me alone. They kept driving around the Sonic and wouldn't they be inviting me out to church and doing this. Randy and Bubba would not leave me alone. I don't know why me, but they went after me. Did you know all, after I got born again, all three of us became pastors, amen, and preachers and went to the college together? There's something about having that kind of a influence and, and togetherness. So I'm proud to say that this is a gospel-centered church and our focus is on Christ. And in many different ways, you work together to promote the gospel. No matter whether you're at work or whatever you're doing, you're promoting, whether through the local ministry of this church or the global impact that we're doing. And let me say, like Paul, I'm thankful for the legacy. Paul said being confident in this very thing. That he which begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. The song said he never stops working. He never stops. When you don't see it, he's still working. When you don't feel it, he's still working. And I believe in my heart there'll be a legacy of this church when I'm dead and gone. Amen. That it'll still go on and still be affecting the next generation. Can I get an amen? The word legacy means that something transmitted by or received from an ancestor or, or predecessor or from the past. In other words, you picked up something and you carried it on. I pray you carry on the gospel. Amen. And you keep pressing on with the gospel and you, you keep using what you've heard here. Paul states that God began a great work in those at Philippi. Well, this verse means so much to me, Joseph, because it tells me that when God started in me in November the 10th, 1979, he's not going to stop until he shows up again. And when God started working you, he ain't going to stop. And you get uh, uh, upset and mad that this didn't happen or that didn't happen, but God said, I started something in you at youth camp. I started something with you in, in children's church. I started something with you back in the day. I started something with you when, when, I, when I brought you through cancer. I started something with you a long time ago when you had that devastating breakup and I was still for you. Amen. All those things in life, I'm telling you right now, I, I'm, I've started a work and I won't let go of it. 19 years ago, God began a great work here. 
He started here in Southeast Texas. He led a group of believers to start a church in the second campus. And you can't forget, guys, we used to have church in a funeral home. Amen. We met in a funeral home. We moved the dead out before we had the life come in. Amen. We, we've done some things as a church to make things happen. We've raised money. We've done things, whatever it took. And if you weren't a part of that, that's okay. We ain't mad at you. We're just glad you're here. Can I get an amen? And whether you've been here for years or for months, it is God who has begun a great work in you. Amen. And through your faithfulness, God is doing a great work among this assembly. Now, I want to share my love for you. He said in verse 7 and 8, It is right for me to feel this way about you since I have you in my heart. And whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. Paul was saying that when he said chains, he meant chains. He meant if even though I'm not with you as a church, if I end up in jail, I'm still telling you I love you and I have you in my heart. And when I do, I got a funeral this week. And as I walk through the funerals and the departures of those that I've loved, I go back and I think about, you know, the affection that we have. Some churches are cold as ice. Man, they spit icicles. They won't shake your hand. They won't hug your neck. They won't pray for you. You come in, you walk out. You don't get a chance to talk to the preacher. Be with the preacher. The preacher walks out. I was talking to a dear friend of mine the other day. He lives in another city, and he said him and his wife were going to a church, and his wife walked up to the pastor's wife, and she started to say something, and security walked right in between them and said, you can't talk to her now. She's busy. He said, well, she's right there. I can see it. She's looking right at me right now. You can't talk to her right now. She's doing something else, and she wasn't. But somebody, somehow, some way, we got this idea that, that ministry is above everybody, and you don't have a chance to talk with them. I've never wanted to be that way. No matter how big our churches have been, no matter where I've pastored, I've always been the guy that's out front. I've taught the guys the same thing that are with me. We've got to connect with people and stay affectionate. Can you get an amen? amen? So I echo Paul's sentiment. The little country church does and always will have a special place in my heart. I don't mean I ain't going nowhere. This ain't one of them, Pastor must be, no, I ain't going nowhere. I'm just telling you I appreciate you. I appreciate you, and I don't know what a day holds. I don't know what a week holds. You got to live this thing one day at a time, amen? But our family has inherited, my family has inherited a whole new family. You've been with me through my grandkids, my children. I've been with you through your children and grandkids, amen? I, I have baptized many of you, dedicated your kids, your grandkids, done a few of your weddings and a bunch of your funerals, and we have fellowshiped around the table in your homes, and we've, we've cheered on the Astros. Let me say it again one more time, amen? And you've watched our kids grow up, and you've celebrated them, and we've praised together. We've worshiped together. We've prayed together. Listen, guys, Pastor Joseph and I was figuring this out this week. If you could just take in 19 years how many times I've preached to you, if you've been with me that long, Marie, D, if you've been with me that long, 19 years, I want you to think about this. If, if I only preach twice a week, and a lot of times in the beginning we were preaching four times a week. That didn't, didn't include weddings and special meetings and things of that nature. But if we just talked about twice a week, and you've endured 2,000 sermons that I've preached. Let's say I preached 40 minutes per sermon. That is over one 1,333 hours. That's 80,000 minutes that y'all have heard me ramble. If that doesn't blow your mind, that's 55 days, 24-7. That's me starting in January 1 and preaching to the middle of February and never shutting up. Amen. So if you've been with me that long, you've heard that much. Amen. And by now, hopefully we've all learned something. Can I get an amen? So let me share my gratitude with you. I'd like to share my prayer for you. And I'll start closing with some of this. This is my prayer. Paul said that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Now, here are the next few verses. Paul tells him what he was praying for. He prayed their love would grow. Man, if, we could, if our love would grow. He pray, in other words, your love doesn't hit a place and stop. It's got to keep growing. You, whatever it takes to get over to keep you loving, you've got to keep loving. So Paul said, I'm praying that you get over what it is that you keep on loving. He prayed their knowledge and understanding would increase. Do you notice even at no matter what age you are, you're still capable of learning something? You're still capable. I, I was 
I was with someone the other day who was working on his vehicle, and uh, he was trying to take his back brakes off. He was pulling on them and pulling on them. And he said, Pastor, I can't get the back brakes off. And I looked at him, and I, and, and, and I said, you, is your emergency brake on? And he said, yeah. <laughs> so I reached up and kicked his emergency brake off. And all of a sudden, the back brake pads popped right off. And he looked at me, and you know what he thought? I just learned something. You ain't never too old to not learn something. Amen. Paul said, I pray that you increase in that. He desired that they lived holy lives until Christ re returned. He wanted them to be fruitful. And ultimately, he prayed that their lives would glorify the Father. I appreciate this house. And I want you to know that Lori and I pray for you regularly. We pray for the church as a whole. And we pray for individuals as well. And I know that many of you do the same for us. I pray your love for one another increases. That your love for the unchurched and the misfits that when you see somebody that was once like you, that you don't thumb your nose at them, that you realize the same grace that saved you will save them. Amen. Amen. That you continue to pray for the love of the lost. Amen. To reach people. That your love for the backslidden will increase. I pray that your love for Jesus will increase. Amen. Also pray that your knowledge of scriptures will continue to grow. You stay faithful, and I pray you will be fruitful. Now, my last point. With all of the good things that we as a church have done, None of it matters if it's about us. Everything we do is in vain unless Jesus is the focus. The ultimate goal and sole purpose of TLCC must be to bring honor and glory to the Lord. So maybe you're here and you feel that you're just someone who attends sometimes or, or just shows up here and you have no impact. Let me tell you and let me assure you you're wrong. Every person here has an impact on this house, in this community in Southeast Texas. In your own way, you add something special. Maybe some of you are concerned that you're just not having much of an eternal impact. Let me remind you that there are often results in the ministry that are not visible. You can't see them. Even when I don't see him working, even when I don't feel that he's working, Jesus said in Matthew 6, lay not for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust does corrupt and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. What Jesus was saying was there's always going to be thieves. There's always going to be those that are going to try to take your stuff. So don't lay up stuff like lay your treasures up in heaven. In this life, you will never see the result of the money you gave to missions. You may never. In this life, you may not see the impact that your prayer for your children's teacher had. In this life, you may never know the seed that was planted in the lives of those children in the nursery, the children's church, the youth in Forge, or Camp Holy Wild. In this life, you may not know that that visit, that call, that text, or letter means to those you have reached out to. In this life, you may not see the growth in the life of those who attend swap, sis, or live classes, or the other classes in this house that are being taught. In this life, you may not realize the blessing you are to others with how you worship or even play an instrument. Yes, often the results of ministry are not immediate. I've often said that ministry is one, two, three steps forward, one, two steps back. One, two, three, forward. One, two, back. But little by little, we gain ground. Amen. Your growth is my reward. So I just want to say today is not so much for me, pastor appreciation, as it is I appreciate you. I thank God for this house. Amen. Bow your head just for a moment, if you would. Let me pray over you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you for this house. I thank you for the people that you brought. They're my partners. Yeah, they're my brothers and sisters, but we partner together in this. For this church to grow, we have to have unity and strength for one another. I want to thank you for the miracles. I want to thank you that for the fact that we've been here 19 years, and all you've done is expand us. 
Now help us to reach more in this community, the communities around us. Jesus, you are our only hope. We stand in you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.